Alfred Tennyson, in his In Memoriam, writes, I trust I have not wasted breath. I think we are not wholly brain. Romanticism is one of the perennial achievements of the human imagination and in its philosophically developed expression, one of the significant productions of the 19th century. Its residuals are very much with us. And if it is a reaction to, and even a rejection of the Enlightenment, its origins are clearly traced to the Enlightenment itself. Let me quickly rehearse the larger aims of the Enlightenment and then consider the romantic reaction to it. The principal agenda of the Enlightenment is to challenge traditional authority through the tools and resources of a scientific worldview. In rejecting superstition, or at least what they took to be superstition in all of its forms, and in reserving to experience alone the final authority on what can be known, the leaders of Enlightenment thought placed nature itself at the center of philosophical concern. Now nature here includes human nature in its various social, political, and personal projections. Nature as in the essential nature of law, government, belief. Nature as in the nature of the world and the cosmos. Thus the Enlightenment sets itself up against what it takes to be all artificial contrivances the overly analytical scholastic philosophies, the authority of scripture or revelation, the merely invented powers of rank and title, the slothful acceptance of tradition, and the alleged wisdom of bygone times. If Descartes is one of the fathers of the modern world view, let us recall that he helps to set the stage for the Enlightenment by rendering doubt the beginning of all knowledge. Well, of course, in this there were ancient Greek uh, anticipations. Now with Rousseau, we get what might be regarded as the beginning of a veritable religion of nature, the abundance of nature, the sheer beauty and power of nature, natural man being something that has a majesty about itself that's covered over and concealed and distorted by the awkward and artificial impositions of what we are pleased to call civilization, such that with these impositions we cease to live an authentically human life. This is what Tom Paine was getting at when he talks about rank and titles, quote, circumscribing human felicity. Under attack in Paris for his social contract, Rousseau retreated into himself on the island of Saint-Pierre in 1765, later composing his, uh, his famous reveries, his recollections of the, of the solitary promenade, as he called it. Now in these reflections, we find Rousseau arrested by the sound of the ocean waves, which, here are lines that are quintessential Rousseau, the ocean waves which, quote, held my senses still, drove out of my mind all other kinds of agitation. What is it that one is enjoying in such a situation? Nothing external, nothing but oneself and one's own existence. As long as this state lasts, one is self-sufficient, like a god. All this coming from the waves of the ocean. Later, Rousseau commits himself to a disinterested surrender to sensation alone, thus merging with fields of flowers, with streams and woods, and, quote, enameled meadows. Now this transcendent piece is fragile, for, as Rousseau goes on to say, quote, as soon as one wishes only to be an author or professor, all this sweet charm vanishes, close quote. I might say that Willing to be a professor doesn't necessarily eliminate all sweet charm, but the challenge is there. Now, what these passages show is something that was imminent in the ethos of the Enlightenment from the very first, namely, a religion of nature that cannot be fully described with the artificial instrument of language. Had not Kant inserted this insuperable barrier between the world of phenomena 
and that noumenal reality behind that world. But to accept this is not to reject sensual experience. It is to liberate perception itself from its professional mission. Now Kant wouldn't be quite pleased with our drawing out those uh, implications, but his philosophy at once, well, entices us to get to the bottom of things, to see what's behind the screen as it were, to understand at the outset that the formalisms that guide and edit perception are of little avail. But if perception in this rule-governed sense will not disclose the real nature of things, and if science is but systematic observation, well then one conclusion that surely jumps out at us is that science is just another obstacle to the truth of things. Again, if science is based primarily on observation, and if we know that observation reveals merely phenomenal and not noumenal reality, then science has built-in limitations. What happens then is that we begin to think there may be a text behind the text, behind the scene, behind the appearances and the measurements. There must be something that's really true, waiting to be found. And if we can't find it with the eye or ear or the anatomical blowpipe, well, how do we find it? Romanticism is, as it were, science grown shamefaced. There's something else in Kant. His moral theory establishes, it places us as rational beings in that intelligible realm that is outside the causal order of the natural sciences. Accordingly, human nature as a rational nature cannot be adequately understood in terms of causation in the scientific sense, but only through the rational apparatus of the introspecting, thoughtful being who discovers at once that he is a morally free being. Rousseau's man is born free and is everywhere in chains is one version of the, of the story. Kant's moral autonomy and the liberation of the will from the constraints of causation is another. With Kant, it's the laws of freedom that operate in the intelligible realm. Well, we now begin to read a literature, we now begin to hear deep resonances to the effect that what really defines us is our freedom, that what renders us unique in the entire cosmos, apart from all other things, is our freedom. It is the free play of ideas that finally is at the bottom of genius itself. Alas, the way to get behind the world of mere appearances to the world of reality is through that freedom expressed by the exceptional person who actually can come to see things. And when he sees things the way they really are, he sees there's much more mystery than can be scientifically observed and recorded. You see the movement of thought here. Now consider the appearance in the late 18th century of the Gothic novel. Two that come to mind are Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto. In the latter work, Walpole writes a preface as if he is merely in possession of an English translation of a work appearing in Italian in the 16th century, telling of events that occurred centuries earlier. Walpole then inserts a maiden sonnet which begs that the marvels to be reported be guarded against, quote, what? Reason's peevish blame. Now, Mary Shelley's classic is a tale of power mongering at the expense of nature itself, something of a gloss on the Industrial Revolution, but more a searching examination of the promise and then the peril of attempts to reduce nature to something merely assembled. Victor Frankenstein will make his creature will stand as a god of creation himself and will not scruple over the moralist's philosophical niceties. He leaves these to his poet friend, so deeply concerned about all this. You see science and poetry now in a kind of adversarial relationship with the scientist 
taking a kind of high-minded, well, I can leave that to the poets. How telling, then, when the poet, Henry Clerval, is killed by the monster. And remember what the monster says to Dr. Frankenstein, quote, you are my creator, but I am your master. Pause here and think of what's going on. It's the poet whose moral sensibilities are the one thing that could save us from tragedy. That's precisely what the scientifically created monster kills. And the scientifically created monster is a creation now coming to master the creator. What are these horror stories all about? Think only of the paintings of Henry Fuseli, for example. Think of Blake's work. What are these productions expressing? What's the monster all about? What are we prepared to make of Fuseli's nightmare and his polyphemus? The latter presents this giant half-man, half-beast. He's sort of sitting there sulking. Odysseus having driven a stake through the one eye. Polyphemus, the Cyclops, doesn't quite know what's going on. For Fuseli, it was the mystery and fantasy in the works of Shakespeare that allow us to enter a dream world closer to reality than the mere and shifting items seen under the sobering light of day. Well, in all, Romanticism conveys this sense of the mystery behind the reality and the mystery that somehow gets uncovered through the genius of art and literature. It is not something accessible to the eye as such until the eye is liberated from the formalisms of science, logic, and yes, philosophy itself. This is what's behind the phrase often used by scholars, the so-called romantic rebellion against the line and angle precision, the pretensions to knowledge of the scientific community, the mixed bounty of an industrial revolution that began as a servant and now stands as a master of the human condition. With whom do we want to date these developments? Is there a, is there a birthday for this line of thought? Of course, grand movements of thought do not lend themselves to birthdays. But certainly one of the very souls of the movement we call Romanticism is Goethe, who was surely viewed this way by his contemporaries. His dates are 1749 to 1832. A lawyer's son, Goethe would play many parts in his long life. Painter, statesman, botanist, poet, playwright. He is a towering literary figure so much so that one of his major works is often overlooked. I refer to his Farbenlehr, published in 1810. It weighed in at 1,400 pages and presented what was, at least at that time, one of the most detailed analyses ever devoted to, of all things, color vision. Now, what is Goethe doing writing a book on color? Well, he tells us straight away that he is, quote, the only person in this century who has the right insight into the difficult science of colors. That is what I am proud of, and that is what gives me the feeling that I have outstripped many." Close quote. So you see, Goethe himself regarded this as one of the premier productions of his life. In point of fact, in point of fact he believes he has outstripped Newton. The work itself, indeed, is a sustained critique of the Newtonian theory of light. It is a broadside against Newton's physics of light, the corpuscular theory, the entire approach to understanding color as an experience. You see, the burden of Goethe's book is to establish that Newton has told us everything about light except what we see. There's nothing in the physics of it all that tells us anything about how the world actually comes to appear to us and the meanings that we will come to extract from it. It tells us nothing about that most central of visual experiences, the perception of beauty. So Goethe wants to step back, and in this work, I mean, he, he, he's not just doing it in this work. It, it's, his, it's in all of his great literary works. Goethe is stepping back and saying, wait a minute. If this is the culmination of scientific thought on a subject, then science must be 
woefully limited as an enterprise. If this is the most we're ever going to get out of what we all agreed to be the greatest scientific achievement of the modern age, Newton, well, we're not even on page two yet. We want to know about light for one central reason, because the visible world is a world that moves and summons us. It's the world that presents us with the emblems and icons of possible lives. None of this is existing at a corpuscular level. Moreover, if the visual system is stimulated alternately with light and dark, well, color experiences can be generated that way. Thus, we don't even need Newtonian physics in order to generate color out of black and white. And of course, the implications of this are quite clear. We have creative resources within us. We are not entirely dependent on the physics of the external world, even for the richest experiences that we might have. Perception can defy physics. It has organizing and inventive powers of its own. It's not merely a passive process. So that what defines human nature is not going to be the mechanical causation examined in the realm of physics. It's going to be something deeper. Goethe's ten-year friendship with Friedrich Schiller was decisive in, his, in Goethe's writing of Faust. Schiller, you know, is the author of the great An die Freude, the Ode to Joy that Beethoven incorporated so magnificently into the choral movement of the Ninth Symphony. Now there is time here to consider just one of Schiller's influential works. I refer to his Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man. A core precept in Romanticism, of course, is that the dimension of human life that counts most is the aesthetic dimension. And in his Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, Schiller states boldly that, quote, man is never so authentically himself as when at play. Man is never so authentically man. We are never our authentic selves so fully as when at play. And you say to yourself, what could he be getting at here? Schiller, as with all the Romantics, was deeply read in classics. Recall Aristotle on the matter of life on the Isle of the Blessed, where, almost like a god, one engages in contemplative activity for its own sake, not for any purpose beyond itself, but for the sheer eudaimonic form of life that is lived when one is engaged in contemplation of the right kind. The idea being that the divinity within us expresses itself most fully when what we are doing, we are doing for the sheer intrinsic worth of the activity itself and not for anything external to it. This is Schiller's sense of the authenticity of play. It's his aesthetic creed. Now play is not effortless. People consume far more energy when at play usually than when they're at work. If we take play seriously, well, just find a person who has a passion for a hobby of sorts. Find a person who sculpts or paints or tries to write poetry or sails or plays chess. Such persons would give up life's essentials for these consuming passions. And passions is the operative word. Romanticism is about passion. Not lust, but authentic commitment. And commitment by its nature is not the gift of reason, but of feeling. And what is the characteristic of play? It's what we do when we are free, what we do to be free. It is freedom that allows play, and it is in play that we discover our authentic selves. I think too many students who have heard versions of this lecture have drawn from it the implication that, quote, goofing off, close quote, is a mode of authenticity, but one has to digest these propositions very carefully. In any case, here is Romanticism speaking in a voice that, if anything, the modern citizen hears more clearly than perhaps even the 19th century heard it. I'm not sure the 19th century was quite as given to play as we are, though I'm not at all sure that the forms of play we've developed for ourselves 
retained that liberating and authentic quality of play that Schiller had in mind. In important respects, to professionalize an activity is to transform play into business. There may still be commitment, there may still even be obsession, but one wonders if the aesthetic of the activity has been lost in the metamorphosis. Well, let me return now to the more famous Goethe, not the author of a thick book on color, but the genius who wrote Faust. In Goethe's hands, the Faust legend is in two parts, written years apart. The optimistic Goethe is the Faust in part two, saved by attending age angels at the moment when the devil has claimed his soul. But let me go back to what the Faust story is a story about. It may well be based on the life of one Johann Faustin, who flourished about 1480 as a magician, as a master of alchemy and the darker sciences and arts. Almost all of you surely will know about it. Faust is a gentleman scholar, a Donish man who knows much. He knows everything. He's a fellow who has read a lot. He's got glass tubes and Bunsen burners and astrological maps and flowcharts. He is studious. He has a great library. He might just as well have rooms at All Souls Oxford. And he's bored to tears. Life has lost its meaning. He knows everything. Nothing really means anything. There he is. Now as the legend of Johann Fausten himself is usually told, his Christian upbringing finds him a master of scripture, but also a searcher after truth. He becomes an original thinker, an alchemist, but one who longs to commune with the devil in order to possess supernatural knowledge and power. This the devil grants on condition that the devil's service be confined to a period of 24 years, and that at the end of that time, Faustin, having renounced his religion, the devil now may possess his soul. Well, in Goethe's version, there is a wager of sorts between God and Satan. Faust has replaced his religious devotion with devotion to what? Science and rationality. But God believes he can be redeemed and will renounce Satan and his ways. The devil chides God for giving man reason by which he has become, quote, more brutish than any brute, close quote. And Faust, as all this is going on, laments the fact that all his studies have not given him access to the real truths of things. Well, you've now got the picture of this titanically filled head with an empty heart, looking for some meaning, trying to get something out of this earthly life beyond what is earthly. Mephistopheles shows up, all tricked out and smiling, ready for service. Faust makes it quite clear. He's prepared. He's prepared to play the game. He's a sophisticated man, a man of the world. He knows there are no free lunches in Weimar. Well, what it would take for Faust to pledge his soul is for Mephistopheles to create in him an experience of such a nature that he would command time itself to stand still, an experience of such a nature that he would never tire of it. Think of this now. Bored stiff. What is one looking for? One is looking for things that one doesn't habituate to and become bored with. So create in me an experience of such a nature that I would have time stand still means create an experience that I would never tire of. The Faust saga then includes love, power, romance, passion. These are all things people aspire to. Faust goes through one dilemma after another. This fellow is on an ocean of turmoil and an ocean of possibilities. And it's quite a bargain that he entered into, that Faustian bargain. What would you sell your soul for is the question at the bottom of the play. What is it that you would sell your soul for? What's your price? Are you a calculating person? Are you caught up in something other than the categorical imperative, do you see? Here you are, you're free, and part of what it means to be free, of course, is that you can engage in transactions of this sort. 
Goethe worked on this story on and off over a period of decades, beginning in 1773. The finale, part two, did not appear until just after Goethe's death in 1832. Faust by now has been the beneficiary of good and, and, and bad of his own choosing, by the way, and so the question in part two is how the whole Faustian bargain is going to work out. Having gone through the range of possibilities that only the devil can present, and with the terms of the agreement now about to be finally fulfilled, Faust is found looking out over a field that his workers have been toiling on. And then he has an utterly novel experience, the transcendent joy of having his lands given over to all the people. At this point, he begins to be engulfed by blindness, and it's at that point that he sees more clearly the prospect of men and women working a land that is their own and for themselves. What does Faust say with this spectacle? This is the highest wisdom that I own, the best that mankind ever knew. Wisdom's last verdict goes on to say, he only earns freedom and existence who must reconquer them each day." Close quote. Stop with this now. Here's a man who's gone through everything, and what he cherishes most is the spectacle, the reality of freedom. And to have it, it must be reconquered every day. The celebration here, the experience one can have that one would never want to end, doesn't happen to be something at the bottom of a bottle. In fact, it isn't anything that happens to you, do you see? It is the externalization of the ideal of liberty, the ideal of freedom, freedom for its own sake, as the creative, ultimate, moral force of the universe. God made the world freely and gave it as a gift knowing that it was good. One of Kant's young contemporaries was Johann Fichte, and more will be said about him in another lecture. He had written several very important works, one titled The Way Toward a Blessed Life, another titled Characteristics of the Present Age. Fichte is taken by Rousseau's claim, man is born free but everywhere in chains, and Fichte then raises this extremely interesting question. Born free, how would you know it? You know, a fish will never discover water, so how can one know freedom if it's nothing less than a condition of one's birth? Now, on Fichte's understanding, the very idea of freedom only comes about as an aspect of consciousness when it is opposed. We see a bit of this in the position that Faust is taking at the end. It's their freedom that is something he relishes. It is, in the trite phrase we now use, the gift of giving, there is finally this moment of selflessness. It is the externalization of desire. It's the rendering universal as a universal law of nature, something that he himself will not experience or doesn't think he'll experience. Now, having had that glorious moment where he has seen something that would have him arrest time itself, have him stop time in its tracks, Faust must now submit to the agreement. But as his spirit descends and falls toward that depth from which no soul returns, his soul is suddenly borne up by the angels. Faust is redeemed. There's an interesting parallel, I think, between the way Faust ends and Fichte's view that in the selfless life, in de-individuating ourselves, in giving up the merely personal private exercise of freedom and externalizing all of the possibilities of freedom for the benefit of the many, we end up at once with a life that is thoroughly authentic. At the same time, it is no longer in fact a personal life, but now a life that possibly can find itself absorbed into an eternal and immutable cosmic scheme defined by its very nature. Well, what about psychological materialism and phrenological charts? Might Faust's problems not have found a readier solution in contemporary pharmacology? I should tell you that Carlyle was a particularly influential figure in the 19th century, a critic and stern Scotsman, one of the leaders of thought 
uh, in the in the materialist tradition was Pierre Cabany, and we're going to see a reflection on Cabany's writings on the part of uh, Carlyle. After the revolution, Cabany's was made head of the hospital system in Paris. He was an influential and indeed a very capable advocate of the brain sciences. He wrote a series of essays on the relationship between the psychological and physical dimensions of life, concluding that the surest way of understanding us all is through neurology. Cabanis would have quite a following indeed, and a worthy one. His writings to this day read very well. But when Carlyle looks at the claims of Cabani, Cabanis, who would have poetry grounded in the viscera, he says of Cabanis, there he stands with his anatomical blowpipes and dissecting needles, going through a world of wonder on wondering. The Romanticists want us to go through a world of wonder, wondering. <laughs>